We want to take a moment to introduce uh, one of our newest divisional music directors in the Southern Territory. Uh, by way of the UK, we have Nathan Cole, who is a professional percussionist and a conductor. I met Nathan while he was leading the Bristol Easton Band, I think, when you guys were on tour over here. And um, what a high standard they have. And since he's been over here, we've heard him play and seen him interact with the, the young people, well, really all of the adults and young people in North and South Carolina. He holds a fine standard. He is an excellent addition to our team, and we are not going to take any more of his time. We just want to give a good TYMI welcome to Nathan Cole. There's a silent clap with your you. mics muted, and if your mics aren't muted, this would be the only other announcement. Let's just try to do our best to keep our mics off until uh, a, an appropriate time for questions comes up and then we can unmute and ask away. Otherwise, Nathan, thank you for joining us. Take it away. Great, thank you, Bernie. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for asking me to take part in this workshop. Um, I've been watching all sorts of TMI workshops and uh, all the sorts of virtual experiences this week and it's great to be uh, able to share with you uh, my love of playing the timpani and uh, the timpani is obviously part of the percussion family and we're going to explore a little bit of that and just delve into what the timpani means perhaps in a Salvation Army brass band context, uh, in an orchestral context to some extent and just cover some of the general characteristics of the instrument, playing the instrument, tuning the instrument, some of the common techniques uh, that I think we should think about. And uh, then finally, we're going to have a look at some musical excerpts and try and put some of uh, what I'm talking about into practice. Uh, so I'm going to just really cover a lot of things uh, in the next hour, uh, which I hope you're going to be able to take snapshots away from. Uh, what I'm trying to do is impart some highlights of things that I think um, you guys could really benefit from knowing about. And I guess uh, it, it's important to start really with the historical context of the instrument and uh, just a little bit of background of, of why these instruments now exist, how they come to being part of uh, the various ensembles that we now see them in and uh, some of the basic uh, characteristics that uh, we, need to, we need to know about in terms of approaching the instrument. So these instruments uh, came around to the western part of Europe in the 13th century. They're one of the oldest percussion instruments in the family. And back then, of course, the drums were very, very um, uh, simple. They had a bowl and they had a head. There was nothing really else uh, about those instruments. It was very, very basic. And uh, we talk about these instruments now being grand and they look fantastic. They sound very loud and big and bold and they can have a real impact um, on the music uh, that we're performing in but back then they were very simple instruments and um, there was no real uh, high demands on the player uh, technically wise and even musically wise to, to, to be aware of what these instruments could do and uh, if we go on a little bit further in the history of the instruments uh, they ended up being more involved in military situations in court proceedings uh, with royal family and uh, becoming more of a sort of pageantry type celebratory instruments. Eventually you'd see them on horseback and uh, you'd have two drums on the horse and the player would sit on the horse and become very, very much involved in military processions. Uh, they would be played to signify important events and important announcements. Uh, if we fast forward even further in the history of music, uh, they end up being part of small orchestras. Uh, so composers like Bach and Vivaldi and eventually Handel uh, started integrating these instruments into the orchestra. And that's when it starts to get, for me, it starts to get interesting. And some of the things that we see today started to be formalized in how we know it uh, back then. So the first thing we need to say is these instruments are different sized. I've got four drums here today. Each of them have different sizes. And uh, the drums I have here today include a 32 inch, a 29 inch drum, 26 inch drum, and a 22 inch drum here. And the purpose of that is so the drums at different sizes can reach different pitches. So unlike the snare drum or the drum set or bongos, for example, conga drums, these are pitched instruments, meaning we can actually select a given pitch on the drum. So just going a little bit further with the instruments themselves, we know that they're pitched, uh, but the heads, that we have on these drums aren't like you'll see on a, uh, for example, on a bass drum or something. There's a different variety of drum heads that you'll see on this instrument, all different sizes. 
The drum heads I've got here today are plastic heads, uh, but you'll find in different situations and different drums, you'll have plastic heads, you might also have calf heads, you might have uh, goat skin heads, all different types of drum skins which sit on the instrument. And of course, the different skins produce different sounds. Um, we'll go into that a little bit as we go through. So we have different sized drums, different types of heads which we can put on the drums, different ranges of pitches which we can find on each of the drums. And of course, well, how do we then change the pitch on each of these drums? Well, in this case, we've got uh, pedals on each of the drums and I can move the pedal up and down. And what that does is tighten or loosen the tension on top of the head of the drum. And so on a very loose head and on my biggest drum, I'm gonna get a very low sounding note like this. So that's a very low sounding drum. But as I move the pedal up on the drum and it creates tighter tension on the head, the pitch goes up. So sometimes we hear that as a kind of comedy thing in, 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 a, in a film or something or some joke sort of music, you'll hear something that goes a little bit like this. And it creates that kind of boing effect. And that what happens there is essentially that the pitch is just changing because the drum head is getting tighter. And so that happens across all of the different drum heads. And as I go up the drums into the smaller drums, the pitch obviously gets higher. So I'm just demonstrating the fact that these drums have different pitches and we should be aware of actually which pitch sits best on which drum. And we'll come to that a little bit later. There are different types of pedal actions uh, that we have. Um, these are actually Adam's drums and uh, these are balanced head pedals. So they're basically you, with, when your heel comes down, the pitch comes lower. When your toes push the pedal up, the pitch is gonna go higher. And in a core band setting, um, even with the, the territory drums, I think they play Yamahas down there in Atlanta, uh, those drums are operated with this style of pedal. So it's something to get used to because most of the time you'll be able to use this pedal action across a lot of the drums that you'll see, certainly in the South, in the Southern Territory. Uh, the other action you'll see sometimes is on um, drums called Premier drums. And they're more uh, familiar in the UK or, the U or in parts of Europe. Uh, and then if you get to the, the symphony orchestras, uh, they've actually got completely different style pedals, uh, which are actually really quite difficult to, to operate. And that involves putting your foot into the pedal and actually kicking it out to the left to release it and then back in. And they, they look like ringer drums. So they're very different, um, but they're really uh, quite difficult drums to, to learn how to play to begin with. So I'd encourage you to get used to the pedal action on these drums. And in most core settings, you'll have two drums. So get used to how those pedals work and uh, moving from one note to the next note. So some other sort of general characteristics to be aware of. I like to sit when I play timpani. Some people like to stand. I prefer to sit and I like my music stand to be right in between. So if I've got four drums here, I'd have them between the, uh, two drums. Okay, right in the middle there. If I had three drums, then I'd decide where best to place uh, my music stand. Things to think about when you're positioning the music stand, obviously you need to be able to see it, but you also need to be able to see the gauges on the instrument. And most importantly, you need to be able to see the conductor. You've got to have a three-way kind of vision. Uh, there's a lot of peripheral vision involved in playing percussion. And in this case, actually having the music stand where you can see the conductor, uh, the music itself and the drums, knowing where you sit amongst the instrument, being able to see the gauges, are a really important thing. Uh, being aware of the conductor, and I'll say this right now, being aware of the conductor is probably one of the most important things when you're laying yourself out in the percussion section as a timpanist, make sure you can see the conductor. Eyeball the conductor, make sure he knows you're there or she knows you're there, and then that will make a really good start to any rehearsal because there's nothing worse than percussionists just looking around the room, not quite sure where they are, what they're meant to be doing, have yourself seated, get in early, get focused, get set, and you can have that communication, uh, visual communication with the conductor. Uh, I, as I said, I like to sit when I play and having the, uh, the stool right in the middle of the drums between these four drums is really useful. 
that way I can move myself around the instrument. Um, it's, it's useful to kind of just play one, two, one, two. Just a very simple exercise to make sure that you can move between all drums. That's a really useful thing to be able to do. and Just make sure that you can cover the area that, you, that you're in. Uh, there's some simple maintenance and care things that you should be aware of. When the drums are out, um, obviously they're not going to have any coverings or anything on them. Please do not use the timpani as a, as a table. You'll see this all the time. Don't put music on here. Don't put, you know, sometimes we get, it's always the cornet. Still come along and put the cornet on the drum. And they're like, okay, it's not a table. Take it off. Move it away. Yeah. The bass players will always be saying, can you move back? It's too close. So give them a little bit of space as well. That's always another consideration. Um, and you, you are a loud instrument. Okay. So be aware of who's around you, your surroundings. Give people a little bit of breathing space. Um, and just be aware of where you are. But maintenance and care of the instrument, don't put things on the instruments. Don't you know, leave uh, instruments or piles of music, which I've seen before. And, and also, when you finish playing with the instruments, put the cases on them, put the covers on them, put the case, wheel the instrument away and put it somewhere safe. Something else that I've seen in my time are sometimes instruments stored on top of each other. So we actually take one timpani, turn it up on the other side and put it on top of each other. Never, ever do that. You will break the instrument, you will damage the instrument, and you'll end up in a situation where you're having to spend money to repair it. Uh, and that goes for transporting the instruments as well. Be very careful that you, I try and pack the timpani first, put them right at the back, um, store them either on one side of the van or a truck, whatever you're using to transport the instruments, um, and just make sure that nothing goes on top of them. It's a really important thing, which a lot of the other people in the, in the band potentially uh, won't know about. Uh, good, so that's sort of some general things. Um, just going back to positioning the instruments, some conductors like to have the timpani on a certain side of the band, and uh, that's, that's something that you can talk about before you reach the rehearsal room. And I like to have that conversation with, with the conductor. Uh, sometimes they have a view, sometimes they don't. Uh, my preference is to sit between the bass trombone and the second E-flat bass. Uh, that's where I like to sit in that corner. Um, I used to play for the Corey Band in Wales. And uh, a lot of what I was doing, I found I was interacting actually with the bass trombone. And musically, I was interacting with the E flat basses, the B flat basses, and de depending on what sort of musical context I was, I was involved in, I found it to be the best place in the band to be. Some people say they want to sit right behind the basses, but I find that a huge visual distraction because they're moving from side to side. It's very difficult to actually um, see the conductor and, and feel part of the band. Um, and then some people like to sit behind the second cornets, which for me is a complete um, uh, just, just misunderstanding of the instrument and the placement of, of the instrument within the band. Um, it's not very often you play with the second cornets. If you do, it's great, and you can talk about it, and you can think about how that works musically. Uh, but I, I like to position myself between the bass trombone and the E-flat bass in that corner of the band. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about sticks or mallet choice and uh, just cover some of the things that, um, that I've experienced and I, my preferences with the instrument. Um, as ever, I'm talking about it from my perspective and uh, there is never any one right way to approach playing anything. Um, I'm just talking from my kind of uh, my, my experience and my preferences over the years. It's probably interesting to, to explain at this point that my teacher uh, in the UK was and still is a professional timpanist for the London Mozart players, uh, percussionist with the London Symphony Orchestra. And I learned a lot from him, which I couldn't learn from my Salvation Army brass band experience. Uh, within the Salvation Army, I, I got to learn a lot of music. I got to play a lot. I got to, you know, a lot of contact time with my instrument. But what I learned away from the Salvation Army was so much more about technical aspects of playing, being aware of the musical context of the instrument within what we're playing, and the things to listen for, the things not to do, the things to do, um, and that there's so many different colors and effects and, and, and things to be aware of. Um, and the first thing that comes up is stick choice. And often within the Salvation Army, a conductor or another percussionist might say, oh, just use soft sticks, just use medium sticks, just use hard sticks. Try to raise that from your memory <laughs> right now, um, because actually what matters is the sound that you create with your sticks. 
And the conversation I have with other percussionists or people that I'm teaching or conductors, and a conductor might say, you know, I'm really looking for a lot of articulation on that section, but in, in the next measure, I really want that roll to be silky smooth. And in the next measure, I'd really like the, the offbeats to, to come out a little bit more or different types of effects. And me as the professional, me as the guy that sat behind the instrument, that's my decision to interpret that information on how to achieve that goal. And so I try with the, with the best conductors, they'll understand that. Uh, with the ones that want to tell you, you nod and say yes, and you do what you think is the right thing to do. And they'll probably, if you're doing the right thing, they won't ask you another question. Uh, so sticks and mallets, I have a whole range of uh, sticks here uh, that I wanted to demonstrate. The ones that I was able to bring over from the UK with me anyway. Um, just to cut this, this short, essentially I've got felt sticks, I've got flannel head sticks, I've got wooden sticks, um, the big... Uh, uh, soft sticks that I have here are um, the, the, the felt sticks and in the core of these uh, sticks I prefer to have cork. You can also get wooden cores, you can get different types of cores inside the stick but I've got cork sticks in here and the reason for that is the band I was playing with at the time uh, it, it gave me a lot of uh, weight behind the stick, it gave me a lot of possible articulation uh, if I wanted to utilize that but it also gave me the opportunity to create a, a rather big and bold and round sound. Uh, so that's really about the sound that you, wanna, you want to make um, and being aware of the, the, the ensemble that you're playing in. So for example, if I was playing uh, in the Southern Territory band, um, I'd probably want to use these, these sticks um, as a kind of general go-to and I would say that these are medium to hard sticks. They're quite articulate, but they're also quite weighty. So they're quite thin shafts, uh, and that's what I prefer with these sticks. Uh, I actually had these made for me when I joined my, my, my previous band. And uh, it's just, I think, because my hands are quite sort of thin and small, uh, I, I, I wanted those sticks. Some of the sticks you'll see over here, particularly um, in the U.S., are quite big sort of cumbersome sticks. And I try and avoid those because I find that you get a very clunky sound on the drum head. And often they're very big uh, tips of the sticks as well. Very, very head, the head of the mallet can be very, can be very heavy. Um, so I prefer a lighter stick, which gives me the possibility of being articulate, but without being overbearing and over loud, um, but also being able to create a nice roll. So if I was just to play a very simple uh, passage here just to give you an example of these sticks and what they sound like. Okay, so they're quite articulate, but when I got to my roll, it was quite round um, and it wasn't actually overbearing. It didn't, well, certainly in this acoustic, in this room, it didn't sound overbearing. Um, so it's just to be aware of that. Now, I can move to a different type of uh, stick here. And again, these are the, the felt sticks. Um, but they are, these are actually even lighter. And what I love about these sticks is that I can be very articulate, but also very round with these sounds. So these are great for playing piano, mezzo piano passages in music. And I mention this because what I'm trying to do is outline lots of the different technicalities and, and the toolkit and the different bits of information that I think that you're going to be able to need to, to take to the band room or take to the, your practice room when you're approaching repertoire. And, and it's all about what sound you're trying to achieve. So these lighter sticks are actually nice and articulate uh, without being overbearing. Okay, so hopefully you heard some detail in that. Okay. Another type of stick, and I'm coming to the flannel uh, sticks now. Uh, these are great if you're in an orchestral setting, if you're playing uh, something like Beethoven, uh, or maybe even, even some Tchaikovsky in places, it's nice to be a little bit rhythmic and uh, articulate. Uh, these are great for playing that sort of articulate staccato passages. 
And uh, these, are, these are actually made by Kaufman. So the previous sticks were made by Roft. You can find them on the internet. These are made by Kaufman. Uh, so, and, and Playwood as well come up with some really good sticks like this, Playwood. They're, you can find these all on the internet. Um, but these are nice and articulate. Okay, and that's really without playing overly loud. Um, it's just giving that articulation. And sometimes a conductor will say, if they can't hear you and they can't hear what you're playing, they'll say, use harder sticks. No, often not. Okay, actually, someone once told me that the quieter you play, actually the harder sticks that you'll need because you're playing so quiet that you want that articulation to come through. Uh, so just consider that when you're playing something that might be just... It's just remember, always think about what you're saying musically. And I was also once told that if you've got something to say, don't mumble. And musically, I think that's really important. You're trying to convey a musical idea, a melodic idea, a rhythmic idea, a coloring idea. Just try and make sure that you're thinking all the time, what is the purpose of what I'm playing? And how does it relate to the orchestra or the band? Because you do fit in. You have various jobs as, in, as, a, as a timpanist um, to, to fulfill. Just a little bit now on grips and a technical approach to the instrument. Uh, now, without going into a lot of detail, uh, if, you're, if you're someone that studied percussion, you'll be aware of various different grips that you can use. So some people talk about the French grip, the German grip, there's a Dutch grip now, there's even an American grip. And we're talking about actually the way that you hold the sticks. Uh, now, I was kind of taught uh, roughly around the French grip. And for the French grip, that's essentially... Uh, having the thumbs on top of the stick. So if you just lay the, the stick on the, on the drum like that, that's essentially what I'm doing. I have the thumb on the top and the first finger underneath. And then the other three fingers just sit underneath. And what I try and do with this grip and why I like it is because it gives me the opportunity to be really articulate. And if you practice this grip and you build up single strokes and you get yourself a nice roll, it can also be a very... Uh, round and fulfilling and uh, sonorous sound as well. So if I just go back to playing that kind of uh, rhythmic section, you'll hear the kind of articulation that can be achieved with a French grip. Okay, but I can also move between playing a rhythm and rolls. And I think the effect between the two is, is quite good. And having that French grip just enables me to control the articulation really nicely, but also have the opportunity to be quite sonorous. That's the French grip. The German grip is more on the sides like this. Uh, so a little bit more like you would see playing the snare drum. And that's when the stick is really quite free, but your hand is on the side. So it's a little bit more looking like this. which is great if you've learned that way. Um, it can be a really sonorous type sound. I love watching European timpanists, by the way. If you watch Berlin Philharmonic, Vienna Philharmonic, uh, Chamber Orchestra of Europe, any of those fantastic European orchestras, uh, Gustav Mahler Orchestra, they have fantastic uh, timpanists that are so free and easy to watch. Uh, and I learn a lot from them in terms of the approach. Um, I wish that I'd learned probably to play a little bit more in that German grip sense. Uh, but for me, I really uh, appreciate, uh, certainly playing with brass bands, the ability to be articulate uh, when, I, when I want to be. And uh, one of the things that certainly players in the band I used to play with uh, used to say about my playing that it was rhythmic and it was always clear. And I think other, music other musicians will appreciate you if you provide that confident base of being rhythmic and clear and confident and being that second conductor, if you like, in the ensemble, which has the capability to make or break a performance. Um, I was talking a little bit about sticks, and I'm just going to go on to this final uh, stick that I have here. And these are wooden sticks. Uh, and the wooden sticks, I love practicing with wooden sticks. And a lot of uh, the early classical composers, uh, certainly Baroque composers, would have preferred the wooden sticks, and that's what they used at the time. So things like Handel's Messiah, and I'll just demonstrate a little bit of what that might sound like. 
So they would use the wooden sticks and it would be very sort of close and rhythmic and uh, dry sounding. And again, this is where I think the French grip comes into its own. So it gives you the possibility to be really rhythmic and, clar and clarity on each and every note. Um, and that's what the wooden sticks can do. Even if we go forward in time to uh, Holst, and a lot of people will know uh, Gustav Holst's Mars. And of course, that starts with wooden sticks on the timpani. And it's just got that great sort of eeriness and uh, clarity of sound, which is just, it's distant, but it's clear and it's, it's, and it's close at the same time. It's just a fantastic effect, which the, uh, the wooden sticks can achieve. So that's a whole range of sticks. And, and what I would say is that really you need to be able to buy sticks that you can afford, that you need to know the repertoire you're playing, know the band room, know the, the concert hall that you're gonna be playing in and know your drums, know what works for your instrument. And that takes a long time to, to get used to, uh, but I'm very happy to share any links to websites after this workshop, which uh, can, can kind of help you make those decisions. The better sticks, I mean, I will say, the better the stick, the more expensive it is. It's something that you will invest in, but I mean, there's probably something like five or $600 worth of sticks just on this stand here right now. Now I could keep those probably for 10 years and have them renewed. Um, I could have them updated. I could have them refelted um, and keep them maintained. But it's, it's like buying a mouthpiece for an instrument or buying a really good cornet. It's something you invest in um, because it's, it, it really does make a real difference uh, to your instrument. So some basic uh, technical information now just to talk about. And I've talked about actually how we hold the sticks. Uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion to be had on where you should play on the instrument. But just as a kind of general rule of thumb, uh, obviously we do not play the instrument in the center of the drum like that. Some people who have never played timpani before maybe didn't know that. But you do not play like you might with a snare drum. You'd hit it maybe in the, in the center of the drum or closer to the edge. Uh, but with the instrument that we have here, you're looking at about playing three, two and a half to three inches in from the rim of the drum. Um, and let me just demonstrate the sound and how that changes as we go from one side to, to closer into the middle. So hopefully you can hear the difference of the sound as we go through. And really what I try and do, if I'm playing a new set of drums, get into the rehearsal early, uh, close the door, play on various places on the drum head and try and work out where the sweet spots are for the instrument. Uh, this is ideal if you have time, but essentially you wanna get in and work out where the best uh, playing position is for both sticks as well. Now I find in that case, it's probably about three inches into the drum on this drum here. So just consider that. A general point is as you go lower down the instrument, you can actually go further into the drum. You can also play a little slower um, on the rolls as well. So I'm actually playing quite slow in my roll at that point there. As I move up the drums, I might go a little quicker on this drum getting a little quicker and I'm also coming a little bit closer to me to the rim as well as I get to the top drum I was actually quite close to me at that point there um, and it's really nice actually on a top F or a top G or even an A on the on the on the top drum here to play really fast crisp rolls and that's something that sounds really nice um, so it's, it's good to experiment with where beating spots are on the drums and kind of understand how fast the rolls should be because they really do um, change as you play different sorts of repertoire. Uh, so that's, that's just a little bit about beating spots. Okay, tuning. Now we could spend all day talking about tuning and, and I don't intend to do that. Uh, but what I want to do is outline what I do when I approach tuning. And often in a Salvation Army situation, uh, you know what it's like, TMI, we turn up, right, you've got five minutes to band starts. Okay, so everyone rushes into the band room, five to three, whatever time rehearsal is. There's a lot of noise in the room 
Uh, there's a lot of talking. There's a lot of cornets playing high notes. There's a lot of tubers playing low notes. And there's a lot of trombones playing loudly. So how do we actually, uh, you know, how do we make sense of that? How do we tune our instruments uh, in, in here? Well, get there early, okay? Don't worry about what anybody else is doing actually get to the rehearsal early if you can at least half an hour and that usually gives you time to get in and just just fundamentally what i'm talking about with tuning i like to tune the drums uh using the note a and now i have a piano in the room i could go over and select that note a or i could have a tuning fork i could have an app which plays me that a um so I would find my A, which is roughly around there. That's my A. So I would tune the drum. So what I do with, and I'd start on the 29, is I would, I would actually start at the bottom of that drum, move the pedal to I where I think the A sounds. Okay. So often just using one stick as well. Okay. So I'd find my note A. The next thing I do is think about, right, I need to tune some other notes. Say my first piece is uh, in, in D and A, okay? It's a nice easy one to start with. So I've got my A, so I need to know what a fourth sounds like. Bom, 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 that's a fifth, sorry. Bom, bom, so that's your D, and then you would play the fifth. Bom, bom, bom is the fourth. So I move from A to D, to then to my E. Once I've got E, I could actually play a B. And then D, G, I can go down to a G. So within the space of 30 seconds, I've tuned G, A, B, D, and E. So with my G, bom, bom, I can find my C. So I can move around. So you need to be aware of the intervals. And sometimes you'll have a good guess and you'll think, right, that's a fourth and that's a fifth. That's a minor third. So bom, B, C, E flat, C, E flat, and then E flat, B flat. So you need to move between the, the, the different drums to find your different intervals. It takes time. And as you may have noticed, I got that first interval wrong. Uh, because I haven't played for about a year and a half properly. Uh, but you do need to keep your ears in tune and you do need to be listening to what uh, other uh, intervals sound like. Um, the, the other one, really important one as well, is, is an octave. Uh, because with your octaves, uh, you can, it's a really nice one. So if I find an F, I can get my octave Fs. And of course with Fs or Gs, Somewhere over the rainbow. Choose a song that represents the interval that you're trying to think about. Now, that's a lot of information there, and that takes a long time to kind of process. Uh, but really, like I said, the main thing is start with your A, and then your fourth. Bom, bom. And of course, the most famous interval for the timpani really is bom, bom. Okay, so that's quite an easy one to kind of pick out when you're thinking about tuning. To help you if you're starting out, um, there are various apps that you can download for free. Uh, you can go to the app store on your phone, download any kind, even guitar tuning apps are, are really helpful just to kind of confirm or deconfirm uh, what you're hearing. Uh, so I would recommend doing that and just being aware of uh, the, the tuning that, uh, that you've got. So we've got about 20 minutes left, and I, I want to get to the point where we, we demonstrate some of these uh, excerpts. Uh, so just one final thing before we get on to those, those musical excerpts is talking about rolls and damping and muffling. Uh, and we talked a little bit about articulations and the influence that those, those sticks can have. Um, and then we're going to get a little bit onto retuning and pedaling, uh, which I've got a really good excerpt to, to show you for that in a minute. Uh, but um, Rolls, a lot of people say when we talk about rolls, okay, so when you're doing a roll, are you just playing as fast as you can? Well, the answer is no. Uh, particularly when you're playing snare drum, a lot of people see someone playing a snare drum roll and they're going, they're like, whoa, you, you, you know, that's amazing. You're playing really, really fast. Actually, I'm not. 
Uh, and in the timpani, uh, I can demonstrate, this is me playing a role with one hand. It's pretty much what I'm doing. And then with the left hand. Okay, so when we're talking about roles, go right back to basics. Play right, left, right, left. Build up the strength between the right hand and the left hand. So really, as it, at, it, at its basic uh, most points, uh, just using this on a C here, we're just going. Now what I'm doing is I'm using the wrist uh, to, to play that, uh, but I'm also very, very aware of the rebound from the stick. And this is something I see, I probably could have covered this a little earlier, but if I'm playing the instrument, I'm very aware of the stick coming back. You know, in my mind, it's a three-way process. I'm preparing to hit the drum, I hit the drum, and I release the stick from the drum. So there's a lot of different aspects. So that's in its most fundamental form. That's kind of what I'm thinking about. Um, so if I go back, I'm thinking about releasing the stick, like I'm here. So I'm coming right up here. Might even be really high like this, or even higher if the mic wasn't in the way. And then I play the instrument, and then I actually release the stick. And one of the best things we can do to kind of appreciate this is to drop the stick like this and then catch it. And you'll hear that's a non-contact, non-interfered sound. And it's beautiful. So my idea is to try and go. Try and achieve that. I know I'm using a different point of the, of the mallet. But trying to try and achieve a sound which is un, uh, uninterfered, yeah? It's got to be completely clean. Uh, and that can take a long time. Partic and I love playing really quiet, beautiful passages. So if you get something like... That's such a lovely thing to play. That's the timpani at its best, really. Um, and, and then you can talk about how that fits with the orchestra. If you're playing with the double basses, you're playing with the B-flat basses, and then you think of weight. One of the biggest compliments I ever had with the tuba section at Corey, and they're, they're monsters. Uh, they said, hey, we like you because you don't play too loud. <laughs> and that was actually a compliment because these guys want to be heard. I'm there to compliment them in, an often, you know, in many situations. I'm there to give a rhythmic color or front to their sound, and it's being aware of that at all times. So lots of these things, uh, you know, they integrate with, with other things, technical aspects and characteristics. Uh, but going back to the roles, uh, when I was playing that one after each other, that's basically just building that up. And as I get louder, I'm just basically increasing what I'm doing. Um, some players, things get out of control, things get very untidy. And the purpose of playing, you know, really nice roles is to keep, is to create a sonorous sound and a round sound as possible. So just practice literally right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Just, just be moving between the different drums and that gives us a really good sense um, of keeping a really even sound and that's a really important thing even sounds between right and left uh, left hands so so important uh, just a little mention on the fingers of course some players they, they just use their wrists and then and then it gets a little bit like that I like to keep the fingers moving the stick okay so you should be able to see there that I'm using a lot of finger work and that's, my wrist isn't even moving, okay? And that's, that's really about the French grip coming into its own, using that, that pivot between the finger and the thumb. So that's really important just to, to try and develop and be aware of as you go through. Uh, a little bit on damping, and we could, again, we could spend a long time talking about this, but I do want to move on to, to the musical excerpt. Uh, remember that when you play a note, it's going to ring on unless you damp it. So one of the things to be aware of is the harmonic changes. So if you're going from you want to clear up the drums if harmonically it doesn't make sense to keep 
that note ringing and that note ringing at the same time. And you'll know when you're hearing what else is going on around you that you want to clear up those, those notes um, as you go through. So an example for this, and we're going to move on to, to Corpus Christi uh, right now, which is a, a musical excerpt uh, that, that we pre-recorded. And I want to thank Aaron Jackson for helping me out uh, record these uh, excerpts just earlier today uh, in a very short amount of time. So thank you for making that work and to Chris as well for, for helping us out. Uh, but let's just, just look at Corpus Christi for a moment. And I know we have the PDF here. I'm hoping that we can just show that and pick Sorry, it up. Sorry. Yep. The PDF, not the video. Let's have the PDF just briefly, if we could, please. Yeah. So this is a piece called Corpus Christi uh, by Robert Redhead. This was a groundbreaking composition in the early 1990s and uh, written about, obviously, the body of Christ. And the whole concept of this piece was bringing together the various elements and people and bones of the church uh, to represent one body of Christ. And this piece of music was, was written in a time where there was a lot of debate about what style of musical ministry uh, really was acceptable and, and, and the way that the army should take things forward in, in a musical ministry sense. Uh, and that's the context of this piece of music. And so the big ending, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart, uh, is, is the, the climax of this music. And of course, it's, a, it's, it's quite an interesting and involved uh, timpani part. And if we look at measure two, three, four, uh, which is on the second page of this excerpt, uh, you'll, you'll just see there that there's, there's quite a lot involved. Yeah, just, there's quite a lot of, of information and notes and things that we can consider. And I just want to point out a couple of things uh, here before we go ahead and, and watch the excerpt. So if you're approaching this for the first time, and you might go to TMI next year, and, and we might have Steve Cobb come as a conductor and this is actually one of Steve's favorite pieces so it's very likely he would bring it uh, but he would say right Corpus Christi um, and we're going to pick it up at 230 two, okay so me as a timpanist hopefully I've tuned the drums I'm thinking about what sticks I might need to use if you haven't heard the piece of music already you want to go and listen to it that if you get time if you get the opportunity you know it's coming up first thing I go and do get the music go and listen to it uh, but the first thing I want to do is, is, is look at the notes that are involved and, and potentially which drums are involved. Um, and I would write what I call a tuning scheme. And this is quite an involved uh, section uh, for timpani. There's a lot of different notes to play. And um, I would first of all look at, at setting out uh, which uh, notes I need to play on which drums. Now I've done this work before, so I've written in on my score here uh, at 234, I've written A. C, D, F. So that's my starting notes. And what you'll do beforehand, before rehearsal, is get this music and you'll work out, even if you sit at the drums quietly, uh, and just work out, okay, which notes are going to work on which drums. It's what we call a tuning scheme. And the tuning scheme is so important. It's like if you're playing a really hard section on mallets, you'll want to work out the muscle memory. Okay, you'll want to work out which order your hands need to move in. Now, I've got to do that for timpani, but I've also got to work out which drums I'm going to play which notes on. And that involves, obviously, having my feet in the right place, which hands, uh, sorry, which sticks I'm going to use, which hands are going to be where on which drum, uh, and, and, and just really understanding uh, the, 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 the tuning scheme. So I looked at this earlier, and I came up with this tuning scheme. So I would just play a little bit here. This is one measure before two, three, four, and I'm just going to demonstrate as I do this why I'm damping certain notes at certain times. Okay, so. Okay, so that's just a little bit of that. Now you'll notice that I did a lot of kind of, I was damping this left hand as I hit the next drum. And that's because I know harmonically the, 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 the whole chord sequence changes each measure. So I don't want to hear that drum. Okay, I don't want to hear that drum at that point. 
um, particularly when I get to something like 240, uh, where there's quite a lot of harmonic changes going on. So 240 is. So I want to kill that C just before I hit into 242 on the A. Um, I'm also aware, and we're going to listen to this ex excerpt just now, uh, but I'm also aware of the words um, of this. And it's really important uh, that, we're, that we know the music, we know the words uh, of any kind of Salvation Army music. It, it, it's obviously, uh, a, lot of it, a lot of it is written um, around scriptural reference or lyrical reference. Uh, so if we pick it up at 234, the words are, and now... Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. So, bom, bom, bom. What the timpani has is really important. Bom, 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 beam, bom, 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 bom. So, it actually relates not only rhythmically, but melodically at that time as well. So, you've got to be aware of all those different things. Let's just go ahead and, and watch this excerpt from 233. So I hope you, you could hear that and see that, and it made some kind of sense. Um, there's so much in that, and, I, and we could talk about it for such a long time, but consider the phrasing. Uh, consider the weight of what you're playing. Consider the grading of the dynamics. And one of the most important things is to consider, are you a rhythmic uh, person at that time? Are you a colorful person at that time? Are you a soloist at that time? Are you an accompanying figure at that time? And Robert writes, sometimes all of that stuff all in one thing. Um, so you'll hear a lot of percussion in Robert's music and sometimes it really helps uh, melodically what's going on. Dom, 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 bom, 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 And with this, you get a lot of harmonic interest as well. When the drum, uh, when the drum moves from E flat to C and C to A, that's magic because you're really fronting the, 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 the harmonic changes. Uh, and, and you'll notice when I played 250, I was kind of playing the role, but then decaying, which give the sense of real of, of the front of the note uh, more than the, the length of the note. So that's more interesting for me. I don't want to hear... No, no one wants to hear, you know, a really, really loud timpani roll going all the way through that. They want to hear the rhythmic interest and, the, and then the next thing. So be aware of the color um, of what you're doing. Um, and then finally, going into 258 there. Bum, 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 bum. You are, the, at that point, you are really uh, in charge of what's going on. The conductor can do what they want at that point. But if you decide to go... Um, You know, no one's got any hope to save you at that point. You, you know, you're, you're doing your own thing. But my advice to you is follow the conductor. Um, be absolutely aware of their intentions at that point. And uh, like I said, you've you got the possibility to, to make or break a performance. 
Um, now, there is so much that I've covered in a really short space of time, but what I've tried to do is highlight some of the things that I know you guys going out to TMI or different bands, your core band, uh, or, or, or any of the high school bands maybe where you're playing timpani, the sort of things you've got to think about in a very quick um, and uh, short space of time. So in a, in a second, I'm just going to ask um, if there's anybody who has any questions, and um, I'd be very happy to, to kind of answer and give you my perspective on that. Um, now, the ending of, of Corpus Christi, just while we're on this, um, and if I could have the PDF just come back up just to kind of finish this off, um, because this is another thing that comes up. Um, often we get timpani solos, and uh, you'll be asked to play uh, sometimes you'll be asked, oh, more timpani, more, 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 more. It's not often the case. And uh, this is a classic example. And a classic example of knowing the score. So looking at measure 270 at the end, yeah, 270. So this is a famous section, probably one after the present age and the holy war and the call of the righteous uh, and song of the eternal. This piece of music is probably uh, one of the earlier examples of where the timpani really has its, has its own solo moments. And, it, and it's quite involved um, and quite, quite bold at the time uh, when, when this was written. And, and to look at it, it's very, very simple. Uh, but one of the things to be aware of looking at this passage is the band are playing, I think, two Fs at this time. I have the score here. There are at least two Fs, maybe even three Fs. Timpani's Mark Forte with accents. So you've got to be aware that you do not need to match the intensity of the band around you. What you need to do is provide absolute rhythmic clarity with a heavy accent, uh, but not overdone. So I think at, the, at that point at 270, you've got the band going, dum, 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 bum, bum, bum. So that's that first entry there at 270. I'm just going to move this mic out of the way a little. Uh, but Again, I didn't play overly loud, but what I did do was create a good sense of rhythm. Bam, 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 bam. Two, three. Two, three. Two, three. Bam, 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 bam. And there you have the moment where you go to three Fs. So you've got to leave that space dynamically to get to that moment. And then, interestingly, we, we, the whole thing doesn't actually finish with an accent. So I would be looking to have a really quite resonant F at the end. Uh, so the band come in with this huge chord, final chord after the general pause. Bah, then. And I would just dare to leave that top F a little ring, a little ring on, uh, which wouldn't hurt. So just be aware that, you know, when you're asked to play solo sections, it's not always as loud as possible. The same with the uh, Call of the Righteous. It doesn't need to be really overly done, too loud. Uh, the end of Call of the Righteous. You know, just needs to be nicely played with the snare drum and the bass drum has this rhythm as well. Just so it's all matched up, it's not overdone and it's not overcooked. Uh, so I'm all about the detail and the rhythmic clarity without overdoing it. Um, and if you've got a really uh, good, uh, strong band, then you shouldn't have to back off too much. Uh, but if, you, if, you're, if you're dealing with smaller forces, for me, it's more about the articulation and the color than it is about the volume um, and, and the big kind of effects. Because you just got to be there to, to color, color in the, the black and white. So that's really what I wanted to cover. And I know that we've sped through so many different things today. Um, and I hope it's been helpful. And it's one of those things probably you'll want to go back and, and watch and listen, maybe look at that, look at again. And uh, if, if we could come back again and we could talk about different repertoire, then, you know, that's, that would be awesome. Uh, no one has really tackled timpani within the Salvation Army band context uh, in terms of delving into the repertoire. And I think it's a really interesting thing to do. And I encourage any percussionist to go out there and uh, look at the repertoire. There's some fantastic moments for timpani in, in uh, Salvation Army brass band writing. One of my favorites is Rejoice the Lord is King by Ken Downey. Ken wrote some fantastic music for timpani. And I used to uh, get the, the opportunity to play a lot of his new bigger works with the staff band. Uh, some, some years ago, and it was involved. It was really involved music. Uh, King of Heaven, 
and even a lot of his slower music, uh, Silent Vigil, I think about Lord of All Hopefulness, there's no timpani in there, but they're beautiful pieces of music which have the scope just to, to learn how to move from one note to the next in the tuning scheme uh, with playing the timpani. Um, and also some, some music by uh, James Kerno, things like The Great Salvation War, Faith is the Victory. Uh, they're just they're good pieces to learn how to get around the instrument uh, with some even some glisses in Faith is the Victory if you want to use it. I never play that, but that's an option. Uh, but uh, just, you know, uh, there's opportunities for you to get around the instrument in, in, a, in a more um, obvious way. And just my final point is before, if we have any questions, I, I, I'm very happy to answer. Uh, really learn to love the timpani as its own instrument. So many people look at this as just an add-on. Oh, just go and sit on timps. Just go and play that. You, you know, you might be the weakest out of three players or something. You think, I'll just put him on timps. You know, playing timpani well is, is probably the most highly regarded thing in the orchestra, uh, certainly in an orchestral setting. Um, and playing it well in the brass band, it just it, it makes such a difference to the quality of the overall performance and the quality of your percussion section. Uh, just going on that, I, I was fortunate to play uh, in the band I did where all of us kind of specialized on instruments. And if you've got that luxury, if you're an amazing drum set player, go and sit on drum set. If you're an amazing mallets player, you know, you, you can utilize you, yourself there. If you're great at doing auxiliary percussion, put yourself there. Um, and we had someone that was really nice mallets player, but also was a very lovely cymbals player. And so if we had a march, they'd be on cymbals and I might be on bass drum and um, don't be afraid to say, hey, you know, this isn't my forte. You go ahead and play it. Or, yeah, this is my forte. Go and do it. But as, as you're learning, try and do everything. Try and play all the different elements of the percussion section. Uh, but when you get to that point where you might be like, yeah, I'm actually, I, I, I'm really quite good at this. I think I'm, I'm good and I think I'm comfortable at this. You know, explore it and run with it because you'll, you'll really enjoy finding the repertoire for your instrument. So thank you. And uh, if there's any questions or anything, I'm happy to answer. All right, doesn't look like we have any questions, but Nathan, thank you so much uh, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us today. Um, I definitely think it'd probably be worth uh, doing a part two mm -hmm. uh, to this. Uh, I, th I think with all the percussion stuff, I think we could maybe keep on doing a little more digging into all of this stuff. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you'd be willing to do that, maybe we could set that up sometime. But again, thank cool. you for today. Um, all of... Uh, our master classes will be up on YouTube, our department page, which is USS Music and Arts 1. Uh, so as Nathan said, uh, you should revisit this as you continue to learn. And perhaps when you come back and look at it at a later point, something will jump out to you and, and you can run with it from there. So thanks again, Nathan. Um, Thank Bernie, you. did you have something to say? I was just going to say we should take a portion of this and send it to all of our music directors because, you know, they particularly how to store timpani, how to transport timpani. I, I always get made fun of, Nathan, because I bought flight cases for a timpani because when they travel in a the truck, they become battered and tattered. Mm -hmm. So I prefer to transport them, of course, safely in That's proper wisely. cases. <laughs> yeah, very Protect wise, very wise. Thousands of dollars <laughs> protecting our, just like we would transport a bass, you know? It's a very exactly. expensive instrument. Exactly. Anyway, thank yeah. you for your work today. No, yeah. thank you. Appreciate it. Um, guys, uh, we've got a couple more things still happening uh, at the end of this day. We've got the late night with Marion Platt, uh, Major P. Uh, so be sure to check that out. Thank you for joining us this week. And again, uh, revisit all of these master classes on our YouTube page. All right. God bless. And Bernie's got one more point. USS Music and Arts 1. One. All right. Have a good day. Appreciate Aaron, it. Thank you. you guys. You're so close, Aaron. You're so close.